Hey guys, what's up? I am finally bringing that Q&A video that I mentioned, I don't know, around New Year's Eve. No big deal, I got around to it eventually, that's kind of how I roll. Um, I wanted to do it now because I want to do a life update video and a lot of the questions that you asked were really great and kind of played right into the whole New Year's, New Year goals, all that stuff and that means I can announce my big announcement. So. I have questions that you guys asked me from Instagram and I have some from YouTube and if you guys ever want to do this again by all means ask me questions ask me questions whenever you feel like it and I'll just save them for a rainy day sadly I don't get very many questions like this so I can't really do anything like that I do have one that I can do for like a suboxone themed video and I'm gonna save those for um, a specific video there are a few suboxone questions I'm gonna touch on today but I want to do like a dedicated Q&A video for suboxone I'm sitting here entering the wrong password. This is my son's phone, it's my old phone. Yes, my four-year-old has an iPhone, but whatever. I um, am entering the wrong password because I'm entering my password, not his, good lord. Okay, so we're gonna start with the Instagram questions and some of you guys have some really, really good questions. I'm excited about it. Let's get this open. Okay, before we get into it, you know the drill. Go ahead and like this video, and if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I put out videos pretty dang regularly now, like. I would almost say weekly, for sure legit weekly, and I talk about everything from mental health to addiction to autism to sensory processing disorder to antisocial personality disorder, which are sociopaths for many people, but that's not the legit term. But yeah, I talk about anything and everything, anything that really tickles my fancy, and right now a lot of that is about sensory processing, being neuroatypical, and being an adult because I'm struggling at that part, but I'm getting better. so. That's what today's video is going to talk about. Okay, so the first question is, name something you can do that you now that you couldn't do a year ago. Well, let's see. Okay, this is a this is a great one. This year, this month, January, this past month, I guess, I successfully had a month without any depressive days in bed. Right. Now, I was pretty dang sad last year. You guys know that. I talk about it all the time. But I didn't have a single month last year where I wasn't in bed depressed, unable to get up. And I would say that happened literally maybe three times a month every month. I didn't even realize how sad I had gotten. But I have managed to work so far in my grief counseling and with just personal growth that I didn't have any depressive episodes last month at all. I feel so good. I did have like a half day where I was kind of sad because I, I went on a road, like a mini road trip and driving always makes me sad. Music makes me sad, but I'm pretty proud of that. And I know this now because I've been journaling as you, as you might know, <laughs> I'm assuming that you know, I started journaling at the end of last year and it has been so, so helpful. I love it. I love journaling so much. Okay. Any positive character traits you wouldn't have gained without your addiction? I would say that my sense of resiliency really stemmed from my addiction and overcoming my addiction. Even like resourcefulness, I, girl, I could stretch money like you would not believe. I could pull money out of wherever, just like basically like pull it out of thin air. I knew how to get myself well and I knew how to stay okay. And I have tried to translate that type of energy into my sobriety but like it's hard because your addiction pulls out these demons in you that you are just like you will do anything to silence them but that's interesting but I could make a whole video on that honestly but I think that my sense of resiliency has been really started there and has just kind of gone on my relationship with Greg has also played into my sense of resiliency we have been through literally everything like, we dated, you know, as teenagers, now we're together as adults. We ha had drug addiction, uh, arrests, numerous arrests on his part, um, felonies, going to jail, work release, all that stuff, parole, moving out of state. I got married. I got divorced. I sued him for the car accident. We were in that car accident that put me in the ICU. Like, oh, Lord, the infidelity while pregnant. And, like, we have been through some shit. And that is why our relationship is so strong, because we have managed to maintain, like, we've reached this level of open communication that I don't think that you can get unless you have been through some shit. And I'm sure people can. I'm sure people can do it the healthy way, but not me. I don't know what healthy means. But, yeah, resiliency. I definitely learned that in my addiction, and I've carried that on throughout. 
my favorite motivational quote. Ooh, I got a bunch of them right now. So y'all know that I want to be, I want to go from surviving in 2019 to thriving in 2020. And I am well on my way. I'm proud to say it, but like I got my journal right here. Let me pull out my little page of motivational quotes because yes, I have a whole page dedicated to it. Okay. So we got thriving, not just surviving consistency over intensity, which is something I'm trying to maintain because I like to go gung ho and go hard, like intense, and I wait for, then I end up waiting for like motivation to strike, so there will be periods of time where I don't do anything. I'm not creative, I'm not, I'm not doing anything because I'm waiting for this like magical motivation to strike, and it just doesn't work like that. So I want to focus on being more consistent and less focusing on the intensity. Although I do love my creative outbursts, I don't think that it's a sustainable way to work. The moments of most discomfort are your biggest opportunities for growth. And that, that is so true. I'm learning that with my mental health all the time. Slow and steady wins the race. Small habits lead to big changes. So I'm trying to do things slow and steady if you haven't picked up on the, the theme for this year. Literally, consistency over intensity is my mantra for 2020 and then everything else falls under that. You would think it would be thriving, not just surviving, but nope, nope, nope. And then I got, I ain't no damsel, I'm my own heroine play on words there. And if it's not a hell yes, it's a fuck no. And systems over goals. That just means I prioritize systems instead of goals. I see things a little bit differently, but we'll get into that later because I know y'all asked about goals anyway. So next question. The hardest part of YouTube consistency, legit consistency. I have had periods of time where I posted like videos like three a week. I was killing it. I was doing the damn thing and I was so proud of myself, but then some shit happened. You know, my best friend passed away in August and I haven't really talked too much about this, but my dad moved in with me for a couple months from, I think it was like the end of August until Thanksgiving. And that was hard. Whew, that was hard because I didn't have enough space in my own house. As it is, we have a two and a half bedroom home. Like it's literally a half room. It's not even a freaking third bedroom and one bathroom. So three dogs, me and Greg and Emerson in here. And then you add my dad and then all of my dad's belongings, like all of his life. And it was crowded and crammed. And I would have, I absolutely would have done it again for my dad because I love him. And he would have done it for me hands down, like without a doubt. But it was hard. It was hard and I spent a lot of time in my room and it's nothing against my dad. I'm just a very introverted person. So like my home is my safe haven and I need to have that time away from the rest of the world. When I didn't have that, the only place I had was my bedroom. And like if people came into my bedroom, it really, really, really messed things up for me. And like my mom would come over and she'd step in and she's a total extrovert. So like she just, does, sometimes she just doesn't understand how I operate. And I get it. I am weird. I don't like to socialize. I left the house like maybe twice in all of January, but I also had zero depressive episodes. So like, what does that say? I don't really like to be around people and I don't want to push myself to be around people unless I have to. Not that I don't like interacting. I like talking to people. I like texting. I like t communicating online. I like doing YouTube. I like live streams and stuff like that. But like, it's hard for me to be face to face working with someone. So yeah, definitely the hardest part of YouTube is the consistency. I have a like a long list. Like guys, you have no idea how long this list is. Maybe I'll do like a little scroll of it. No, I don't wanna show it because I don't wanna give out all my secrets. But I have this long list of ideas, maybe like 50 or 60 video ideas that I could do. And it's not that I'm not having ideas, it's that just that working consistently is hard. I've had to really dig deep and develop my own system to kind of maintain that like long-term motivation because motivation is fleeting for me and I cannot depend on that. Okay. Do you have any tips for new YouTubers? Yes. I got a lot of tips. I'm not very successful. I mean, by some people's standards, I think I'm successful just because I'm still kicking it here. It's been over a year. I'm still posting videos. I'm getting back into my groove and things are starting to take off again and I'm happy. I have uh, big things in store, but get there, get there, get there. I would say the best tips I can give you are don't worry about anything except for some good lighting, which could be literally just sitting in front of a window or um, sitting, you know, like with, I bought, um, like, what are they called? The daylight light bulbs and just show, I 
you know, made those. I put them in like little metal spotlight things. Like, I think it's hanging up behind me. I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show you. Like this. This is a daylight light bulb, and I put it in here, and then I put like a piece of like soft white um, parchment paper over it, and taped it. It worked. So, like I said, lighting. You can literally do lighting at home. You can buy. You ever see those like white Christmas tube lights? It's like a long like plastic tube, and it's got the white lights inside of it. Wrap that up into a big circle, and you got yourself a ring light. Do not do not spend money on it. Just DIY it. The only thing I would recommend spending money on is a microphone, and I would do that maybe after you've made 10 videos. I used, that's what I did. I set myself goals. Like, I really cared about a backdrop at the time because I didn't, I don't like the way my house looks. I hate the, I hate the wall color. But I, I waited until I made, I think, 25 or 50 videos, and then I allowed myself to spend $40 on a backdrop, which is still literally, you can't see it in the frame right now, but it's still hanging up back there. I never use it because it's way harder to use than I expected. Like, the color balance is weird and whatever. But set yourself goals like that. Work towards earning a microphone, work towards earning lights, work towards, you know, I think after 100 videos or, no, it was 25 videos, I bought my backdrop, because 25 doesn't sound like a lot, but girl, it's, it, that's a lot of videos, and then I did 50 uh, videos, and I got my box lights, they're just like big box lights that photographer, photographers use, and I love them, I love them so much, I used them until I paid, I think, 40 I got my ring light on sale for like $40, and it can hold my camera or an iPhone. I didn't get a camera until a very long time into it, and honestly, I still use my iPhone a lot because it's easier. It's I edit on my iPhone. I prefer to edit on my iPhone. I have the software because I was in graphic design. Like, I love all the Adobe suites. So I have, like, Adobe Rush, and I have Adobe Premiere, and I have Epidemic Sound Music. I have all these things that I just don't really use. So it's like, keep it simple. Keep it simple. And then make a 100 bad videos. Make a 100 videos with absolutely no expectation on them other than they probably will suck. Make them for no one but yourself if you have to. But put them out there and, and just do it because no one's good at it when you start you're gonna be awkward you're gonna have the ums and uhs and stutters and you're not gonna be perfect and don't worry about perfect because I cared way too much about it and I <laughs> edited literally every stutter and stumble out of my videos and it was just so choppy ah uh, looking back I wish someone had told me that make a hundred bad videos first just make them about whatever you want post them if you want don't share them if you don't have to but a hundred videos is so much practice you'll be so much I don't even have much more than a hundred videos on my channel right now and don't worry about the subscribers because one day you will get a thousand subscribers and you'll be like well shit I've been here for like two years what happened and it just does it like that sometimes you just get big spikes in subscriber counts and that mostly comes from networking I've learned that networking is the number one way to get big subscriber boosts but I don't care about the subscriber count I care about building a community of people on here that I can relate to people that will have my back and I can have your back and we can grow together so yeah if you guys want more suggestions. I feel kind of silly doing it because I have 2,500 sub subscribers, but dang am I proud of that. Do you guys realize like we won't even ever meet that many people and know that many people on like a friendly basis in our lifetime? So 2,500, that's a lot and I'm proud of myself, but okay. Let's see. What's the next question? Okay, goals for 2020. Yes, okay, goals for 2020. I am working on mac and cheese yeah. is that what you want for dinner that? that says lunchable you had a lunchable for lunch yeah. here why don't you come into the frame he has a, a little meal picker where it's a little spinny wheel and it's oh <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I bumped your head. A Lunchable? I don't have that. A Lunchable? What? <laughs> lunchable. <laughs> I don't have that. <laughs> don't know if you can tell, but I had a little bit of an interruption, so now I'm going to carry on. Okay, goals for 2020. I have big things in store for 2020. I am actually 
training to become a certified life coach, which I am very excited to have started this journey. I feel like everything just kind of fell into place all at once and I can't even believe it's happening. So I lost my job in December and it was just heartbreaking, but expected. I've talked about it in other videos and it just, I don't know, I didn't realize how miserable I was until I lost my job. And I didn't realize how much of it was partially because of my job. It's not that my job made me like that. Like, it was a whole bunch of other life factors and my job just wasn't good for me anymore. And it sucks because, like, I loved my boss, I loved my coworkers, but it just didn't, it ended on a bad note and that sucks. Um, but I happened to be in a place financially where I could just figure things out. I took some time, really thought things over. I really started to lean into my mental health struggles instead of like resisting it and pretending like everything was okay. And that led me to coaching. I actually had an interaction. I've had a couple interactions with some, some of my subscribers, which you guys know who you are and I am so appreciative of you. But one in particular was for someone named Kat. And Kat, I don't know, the stars aligned when I met her. She reached out to me on Twitter, which is something that I don't use very often, and I was able to help her in a way that was just so rewarding for me. And it came in a time when I was at my lowest, and I was still able to give back, and I found so much value in that, that it was like focusing on me wasn't helping anything. It was making me more depressed. But by focusing on someone else and helping them blossom, like, really helped me. And... I don't know, that was just the start of it. Then there's someone else named Kim, and she's really great. She's so kind. I just love you guys so much. And I could not have gotten here without this channel. This channel has really shown me who I am, what I stand for, what I believe in, and it's given me the confidence to do things I never imagined. Like, be so vulnerable and be so open. So, I'm working on becoming a certified life coach. I am considering focusing on a couple areas, a couple niches, or niches, niches, whatever. I say niche, but one of them would be for women in recovery, established recovery, maybe long term. I don't know how I want to define it. I'm just, I'm not a doctor, and I'm not a therapist, and I'm not trying to be, and I don't want to take away from the actual recovery journey process that you have to do when you first get clean, because that's not what I'm looking to do. I don't want to do the clinical side of things. I thought I did, and that's what I was looking for for jobs, and then I'm, I'm just, I'm glad that that didn't work out for that job, because that, that's not what I want at all, and I am lucky enough to have realized that without losing any time. And I want to work with women that are, you know, in recovery, already established, that are just stuck. You know, maybe the conventional way wasn't for you. Maybe you have been in recovery so long and you've, you've, you've done so many things, but you just feel like you can't make progress. You're, you're stuck. You know, you're, you're just surviving and I want to help you start thriving. And maybe I want to help women that are neuroatypical like me, you know, women with ADHD or autism or um, sensory processing disorder. Maybe, you know, I struggle so hard with executive functions, which is like organizing, planning, scheduling, you know, just like organizing your life, staying clean, you know, all of that stuff. I don't do very well with that unless I have systems in place to help me function. And I didn't have them shit, I didn't have them like a month ago, and I am getting so much better at so many things, and I can't wait to share that with you. One of the things that I'm doing is working on, I'm working on this upcoming video about distractions and how I manage my distractions, and this has been game-changing for me. Like, holy shit, the amount of stuff I get done every day is amazing, and I was just making that video crying to you because I couldn't, I don't know how to function as an adult, and now, like, within a month, I have been working on myself because in the coaching process, when you train, you are your first client, and I have been able to do so much and change my life so much so quickly, and it's been so awesome. So awesome, and it feels so good. And I don't know, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to turn that into a business, so that's what I want to do. I'm going to be a life coach, and honestly, I have other goals. Another goal for 2020 is just weekly uploads on YouTube, and I kind of 
gotten a little close to not doing weekly uploads, but I'm getting better and I'm, I'm pushing myself, you know? I wanna keep building on these systems instead of goals, which is really getting a weekly work schedule, getting a, a household schedule, getting, you know, structure in my life because I need it and Greg needs it to, to thrive, so Emerson needs it to thrive. So it's only gonna help us to have if it's Kimball family system and I don't know. I, I have so many great things that I can't wait to share with you guys. So many, some, like, so many upcoming videos that I've been working on, and I'm really, really excited. But, yeah. Let's go on to those YouTube questions. I have to look off my computer now because Emerson took his phone back. <sighs> okay, so the first question I am going to touch on, it's um, about Suboxone. So, I'm only going to answer it briefly, and I will follow this up with a Q&A all about Suboxone, like all of the questions I've ever been asked about Suboxone. But this question says, there's so much to ask. Personally, did you ever struggle getting on Suboxone? Yes. Did you ever relapse? Yes. Don't answer if it triggers you, or if it, but it's something I struggle with. Girl, no worries. I ain't triggered here. Uh, I won't go into detail, and, and I, you know, I'll give an appropriate trigger warning for the future video, but it says, she says, I've been sober for more, for way more often than not for the past four months, but at every day, but a day or so every few weeks I cave and get high. Help me please if you can, no one understands what this is like. Yes, I completely understand and I 100% did that. And I did it when I was on uh, house arrest. So I was doing weekly check-ins and I was just not in the best place. And I wouldn't say mine was like once every couple days, mine was maybe once a month, but I would just revert to old friends and old tendencies because I was lonely. And that was my biggest trigger at that point. I was loneliness, loneliness and boredom, you know? I, all I could do was go to work and then come home and sit. And every now and then I'd have a friend visit and she wasn't exactly the best role model. It was my decision, it was not her fault that I did that at all, I'm not blaming her at all. but. I want to get into a story time too where I tell you the last time that I used. The last time that I used, I don't know the date, so I guess I could figure it out. If I think back, I would, I would have been on work early, so it would have been like a year afterwards, so I don't count recovery clean time like normal people, but I guess if you did, you could say that I've been in recovery for 11 years now instead of going on 12, which is fine. I. I don't add the value to that like others do. I used to. I used to care and count all the time, and, and then I just, I was doing it for other people. I was doing it for show, but I would have been on work release or, no, no, I wasn't on work release. That, that was wrong. I was on house arrest, and I actually think I had just gotten off of house arrest, and it was... Sorry guys, it's been a long time. It was right before I went on house arrest because if you remember, I said that I got out of jail and then I had like a three month window before I had to go on house arrest. And I was working and my best friend overdosed and then I turned around and overdosed and it was bad. It's a bad story. And that was the last time that I've ever used. I watched my best friend overdose twice. And this isn't Brent, you know, this is a different friend. I won't say her name. This is my female best friend. I have my, my male best friend was Brent, and he's the one that passed away in August, but I don't know. I'll answer any questions you guys have. So if you have any questions related to my Suboxone experience, like the, the tapering on, tapering off, you know, I've been on it and tapered off successfully. It was off for a couple years, got back on it. I've been successfully tapering down now. If you have any questions at all, please ask. I'm going to be an open book. I have nothing to hide about it. I do advocate for it. I know a lot of people probably wouldn't if they were in my position, you know, like been on it long term, been on it way longer than I ever anticipated. I've lost people to it, like actually lost people to the medication buprenorphin. I have... It's just been a, it's been a ride and, you know, going from abusing it, I abused it in places I shouldn't have abused it and I, now it's a lifesaver. But that's another video. I just wanted you to know that you're not alone in struggling and I struggled too and I got it together. I, I, I don't have an exact, like, magic cure, but I can tell you my story and hopefully that can inspire you to, to find it within yourself too. You're not alone in this, don't worry. We love you, I love you, I hope that you make it. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So here is another, the next question is, what are your goals for 2020 for your channel? 
what are what is your thought process of the steps to achieve those goals and what are some personal goals for 2020 for both you and Greg if he's participating that is well he's not participating in this video and that's actually because Greg doesn't really think forward like most people do I think it's because of his antisocial personality disorder it's not you know future thinking forward thinking is not something that they do and he actually is getting better. We you know, have rebuilt our credit. We're working on saving money right now, so hopefully we can buy a house within a few years. But I'd have to say, if you know, if I had to guess what Greg's goals for 2020 were, it would be to pay off his debt, because he's got, he took out a little bit of a loan for his bike, which he's almost got paid off, and go mountain bike riding. Yeah, that's I guarantee that's what it is. Go mountain bike riding with with Emerson because they love to go biking and it's so cute and I love it. But okay, so goals for my channel, weekly uploads. How I do that? I have devised a system which is just you know Monday through Friday. My mom still gets Emerson for a few hours, like as like as if I were working. She was my daycare. Thankfully, I have that you know awesome availability from her. I couldn't. She's just my mom is such such a I love her so much. I can't even think of the words to describe it. My mom has seriously made my life so much better, and she's a blessing. So Monday through Friday, I have a couple hours every day to work on training right now. I, I dedicate like two to three hours in the morning. Well, I mean, I can kind of go over my system. So I wake up in the morning. I make my bed, I do breakfast, I get Emerson dressed and ready. You know, he goes to, my gra to his Grammy's house, and then I finish getting ready. I like do my, my hair and makeup, skincare routine, all that stuff, get dressed, sit down, and then I focus two to three hours just to sitting on coach, like the coaching, the training part, and then I will take a break, usually get lunch, and then I focus an hour on YouTube. And that has been a lot of different things. I've done some classes on the back end. I know I've said before that I was working on the back end, so I did this one thing called YouTube for Bosses, which is a Sunny Leonard Easy product, and it's highly recommend it. It was so informational and it taught me a lot just about like the metadata meta metadata and thumbnails and tags and all all that stuff. And then I um try to focus like different days to different things. Like Monday I like to do my scripting and researching or I do scripting. And then and the next day I will usually that's not where I start. <laughs> I start with um research and that's usually done on like a Sunday. I should do it only on weekdays and then save my weekends for other things, but I love doing this so I do it all week. It's a Sunday right now. But I um so I, I do research, which is, you know, coming up coming up with the video ideas, researching the keywords and tags and titles and all that stuff, playing with different titles, playing with different thumbnails. Blah, 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 blah. Then the next day I will do scripting. And that is kind of like more research but in depth. I don't script it, script it, but I have like this outline format that I try to follow. I'm not following it today, so this is gonna be a little bit of a longer video. If I have a shorter video, that's because I'm following my scripting process. Um, then from there, the next day would be to film and then edit is usually the following day and then I can post it usually by the end of the week. And I haven't quite followed it to a T. I've been focusing more on coach training, but I do want to get out weekly videos consistently and then I want to get up to two weeks of video, two weeks of video, two videos a week. I want to I want to get this going as much as I can, but I want to do it slowly and sustainably because I want this to be lasting. I want to be able to make a profit from this. I want to be able to build my biz business from this. I want to be able to establish credibility and show you how I'm changing and what I'm doing and all that fun stuff. And I also want to start showing you more of myself and showing you just different sides of myself. So um, let's see, what's the next one? What is your thought process and the steps to take? So I kind of broke it down. Systems, not goals. Like the goals, I have end goals. I have like, I'm the kind of person that sets big lofty goals. Like you know, collab with Christina Randall, collab with Jessica Kent, like, that one's happening this year for sure, but, like, I set these big lofty goals, and then I try and think about who can do, who does that, who has collabed with them, who has done that stuff, how do I become more like that person, and then I want to try and break down systems that would get me there, like, setting up a schedule, setting up different ways to research, learning how to do this, learning how to do that, and just, you know, I try and make it intrinsic to me so like intrinsic motivation it's an internal thing it, I identify with my goals and 
you know, my big lofty goals, they're just a sense of direction. I just, I care about putting the systems in place because I know if I have that system in place, I'm going to get there eventually. Maybe I won't do it this year. Maybe it'll happen another time, but like I will work towards it. You know, maybe a collab with Peter Mon, that would be so freaking cool. But yeah. Okay. So, and what are some of my personal goals? I also want to continue with the systems and I want to get my house in order. I would love to declutter things and have that done quickly. I've been slowly doing it because it's actually part of my coaching process, you know. I have been, like, slowly just, you know, pick, like, a drawer or something, and I go through it, and it's, like, if I have any negative emotions set up, you know, any anything, like, at all that negative I feel about something, I either donate it or throw it away, and it is so freeing. I've wanted to do that for so long, and I could get easily overexcited and go gung-ho and try and do it all, but, like, I can't. I need to hold myself accountable and do things slowly and consistently so that I can make these small, consistent changes for, like, big, big changes to take effect. And I also want to work towards saving money so that we can buy a house, but that's, like, more of, like, a five-year goal. I want to just kind of continue to rebuild our credit, which I'm so, I've got a credit score over, over a, th over a thousand. <laughs> I've got a credit score over 700, which is mind blowing considering like I just recently started to rebuild my credit. I use this one tool called self lender. I don't know if you guys are interested in learning more about rebuilding credit, but I have taken, I have filed for bankruptcy and girl, I filed for like $80,000 in bankruptcy. A lot of it was medical bills, but still, and I've rebuilt my credit from like low 500s to over 700 in the span of maybe a year and a half. Pretty impressive. I'm pretty proud of myself. But if you're interested in something like that, I would love to make a video about that. I'm not like a financial guru or anything. I just have done it. Okay, let's see. What's the next question? What's your favorite video you made this year? Did we already do this one? Did I already answer this question? I feel like I did. My favorite video this year would definitely be, like, YouTube changed my life, or, and the, that one because of the excitement I felt over YouTube. I was like, I woke up early one day, and at that point, I wasn't waking up early at all, like, at all, at all, and I woke up early to do it, like, before work, and I was so pumped to be filming and to have that opportunity, and that was such a good feeling, and prior to losing my job, I could not wake up in the morning, period, ever, ever, ever. And now I wake up every day by 9, 9 a.m., by 9 p.m. I'm, I'm getting a little tired if you can't tell. But by 9 a.m. I wake up without an alarm and get up with Emerson every day. Just, I wish I could have done that when I had a job, like, outside of the home. I wish I could have had that type of, like, it's freedom. It was depression. I was so weighed down by my depression, and now I'm free from that, and it feels so good. It feels so good to actually have a purpose that I, like, it aligns with my heart and makes me feel good. Okay, who's your favorite YouTuber? I got a bunch. So you guys know I like Jessica Kent. Yeah, she's my friend. And I like Ro from Strong Prism Lives. I also really like this one channel, Michelle B. Michelle B. And there's another one called Rowena. <laughs> I'll try and add their uh, stuff up on the screen. They're more of like personal growth channels. There's another one. I think his name, I think it's Better Habits. Better, better, I don't remember. I'm not really good at remembering who I watch. So I'll put a whole bunch of things on the screen right here to show you which ones I like to watch. But mostly I like to focus on like personal growth stuff. I like personal growth. I like psychology. I like anything that is going to teach me something. I like science channels, like the physics girl. I like, you know, brain craft and I just like learning. And I like to make my time use, useful. I like to be like, I, I like to enjoy, I, I enjoy beauty guru shit and the drama and stuff, but, like, I feel like when I watch too much of that, it turns my brain to mush. It really does. I care about things that don't freaking matter and are not affecting my life in any way in a positive manner, so I try not to watch drama stuff anymore, and it sucks because, like, I really like some of the drama channels. Like, Peter Mon, love him. Thankfully, he has five channels, so I can watch his others, like, his Peterisms and stuff, but, like, he's just a funny guy, and... I, because of people like him and, like, Ashley Kyle, I got really into drama over things I didn't care about because I cared about the creators making the drama, vid like, the drama channels. So, let's see. 
What is my favorite type of breakfast? Hands down, I'm a cereals, I'm a cereal kind of girl. I like Frosted Flakes a lot, and I like kind of bl like bland cereals. Like growing up, my favorite ones were Crispix or Kix. I don't know. I also used to eat Pop-Tarts every day in high school, and my high school boyfriend used to call me Pop-Tarts. That was my nickname because I would run late every day, and the only thing I could eat would be Pop-Tarts in homeroom. Is there a low-key way to tell a boy you like them without it being really weird? I would be... Hmm, let's think about this. How would I tell a boy that I liked them? You can do so in a manner without verbally saying it. You can show them that you like them. You can respond positively to what they say. Laugh when they make a joke. You know, like listen when they actually talk. Because a lot of times people will belittle them, belittle them. Don't laugh at the jokes at them. Don't laugh at the jokes other people make at their expense. And try to make eye contact and smile. But don't be like too, too much, you know, too like up their butt for lack of a better words because you want them to know that you like them but you like yourself too so your time is something special and they should value it okay this person said that their crush is dating a girl in the grade above them but she isn't right for him at all and he probably doesn't know it yet da -da 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 -da. They have dreams about them, and they think dreams are subconscious ways of telling you how you really feel in your heart. Even get butterflies in your stomach. How long would you wait for the love of your life? Well, let's go back to those dream things. I think that dreams are a, a way for our brains to work out all of the possible scenarios that we could have, like, that could happen, you know, I have dreams about things, you know, people that have passed, and it's, like, playing out different scenarios I never got to experience in real life, but I think that dreams are important because they do give you the opportunity to experience it and know how you'll feel in that moment without having to actually feel it, so yeah, that that is important, but maybe it's to show you just how it feels, just so you know. Maybe it's for no other reason than that. I learned the hard way that high school relationships are not as important as we want them to be and I was crushed by it. I was convinced that I was gonna marry Johnny and I like told everybody like screw you you don't know what you're talking about like I'm gonna marry him we're gonna get married this is this is the rest of my life and now I don't even talk to the kid. I mean I talk to him maybe once every five years but I think that if I could go back I would, your question was, how long would you wait for the, re for the love of your life? I would wait forever for myself. I would, I think that I should have put myself first. And I think that until I knew myself really well, I would have waited forever for anyone else. Does that make sense? Like, I... I didn't give myself any time to be single. I didn't give myself any time to find out what I liked. I, I was whatever my boyfriend was or whoever my boyfriend was. You know, like I dated the pop punk kid in high school and then I dated a scene kid in college and then I dated the drug scene, you know, the drug scene, a drug kid. And I just, I identified with whoever I was dating and I wish that I would have taken the time then to really learn who I was and respect myself because you have the rest of your life to fall in love and as long as you're filling your life with good relationships that should be more than enough and I know that you know something could happen and we could die at any time but like I would so much rather have had good healthy relationships with myself and my friends and not been in love with like the stupid boys in high school and college even than you know otherwise because I just you can't get that time back and trust me, dating, people date until they're 70. You can date at any age, so just love yourself. Love yourself because you're worth it. Love yourself because you deserve it. And any boy that sees that and sees you, they'll know that you love yourself and they'll know what a catch you are. And if you don't have that, if you don't stand up for yourself, and if you don't learn yourself, if you don't know what you really want and love, It'll show. It'll show that you aren't someone that, you know, is thinking long-term or thinking seriously. And it definitely is why I was so susceptible to fall into the drug scene, because I was just looking for anyone to love me. There was another question tacked onto it, and it really stems into 
consent. And you need to remember that no one else is going to stand up for you. No one else is going to advocate for you. No one else is going to know what you're thinking or feeling. And if you go along with things just to make other people happy, what are you standing for? I promise that you are so worth it. You are so freaking worth it. You are worth waiting for. You are worth advocating for. You are worth loving. Don't let anybody else sell you short and make you feel otherwise. And if they don't want to wait, and if they don't respect you, then you can just kick them to the curb because you don't need that kind of negativity in your life. I promise. I promise you are so worth it. Okay, next question is about my marriage and divorce. I was going to make a video about this soon, so I guess I guess that it is time. I'll tell you a little bit about my my ex-husband. I have, um, let's see, I met him years before, back when I was in the drug scene, actually, and uh, we both had MySpace names, the perks of being a Megan, the perks of being a Joey, from the perks of being a Wallflower, we were book nerds, and he was literally everything that Greg wasn't, and I just fell for it and it kind of happened by accident which is like a whole story that I have to tell you on its own but I randomly one day went to a party and it happened to be at his house and he was a marine and he was nice and he was respectful and he was just so so friendly and just everything that Greg wasn't can I reiterate that and we started dating like literally like that because of a Facebook post where I was vague booking that wasn't even about him and he thought it was and then I didn't want to say no because I kind of liked him but I didn't know what it was going to be like and oh I got married a year later. That'll be a fun video. I'll make that one for you guys soon. Okay the next one. Are you nervous to get off of Suboxone someday? No not really. I'm not really in a rush. I uh, I don't know if nervous is the word for it. I am content on Suboxone because I know that I am not risking like the chance of overdose it sounds kind of stupid right because I'm not using like and I don't plan on using but like what if something happened and things got that bad like I was just so depressed what if it got worse than that you know I have this safety net that allows me you know the ability to not like I can't relapse and gotten overdose I mean I guess I could I don't know but I wouldn't I don't have any cravings I don't have any any triggers nothing affects me like that and my best friend didn't have that. He was constantly hitting low points and relapsing. And he'd get some clean time and then he'd relapse. And, like, I mean, they would work the steps. Him and his wife worked the steps together. And, like, they did all these things. And I have so many friends that really did work on their recovery and really re rebuilt their lives for years. And then, you know, things slowly got worse and worse and worse. And they fell back into it. And they relapsed and overdosed. Okay. What made you and Greg decide to get clean? Were, were you together? What was the motivation for each of you? I got clean. Actually, that's a story I'm going to be telling you soon. That was my own decision. We were separate. He got clean because he went to prison and uh, didn't want to go back to that life. I got clean because I realized that I deserved more than that, and I wanted more than that, and I was capable of more than that. So that's when I got on Subox in the first time. I think, I don't know, I, like, I hate to say that, but, like, I don't know my timeline that well. I'm going to have to really sit down and, like, write it all out to make sure I get that story correct. I don't know, I think I was already on Suboxone, but I think at that point I decided I was going to take Suboxone more consistently and do it the right way. That's, that's what happened. Uh, it has been since 2009, I think, yeah, so it's been over, gosh, guys, it's been over a decade since that all happened. Okay, um... How frustrating is it for you when people judge Greg, Emerson, or you and, the, and say the mental health is due to addiction or drugs or the fact that they say you go after broken people? I don't let it bother me because maybe I do go after broken people, but my broken person is someone I love very much. And I, I didn't settle. I did settle for a very long time with Greg. Greg was not treating me like I should have been treated. And now he treats me so much better. And I can't ever expect people to understand that because I talk about how bad things were and how bad he was or how bad we were that I just know that it's not a normal story. You don't hear of that very often. So I know that there's no way I could ever really convince people that Greg is as good as he I say he is. And I don't know how 
or if most people could forgive someone for that kind of stuff, but I've been able to do it. Speaking of which, actually, I shared a video sometime, I think, last June with Greg, and it was, he cheated, but I cheated first, the untold story of our relationship, and we talked about the infidelity when he was, uh, when I was pregnant, and he cheated with the other Megan, and the other Megan just saw that video and commented it on it, so I'll leave a link in the description in the card above if you want to go check it out, but I pinned her comment. It's like my life finally came full circle. I I had to accept I had to accept an apology that I never got from her. And that is a hard concept to it's a hard thing to freaking do. It's a hard concept to even explain. But basically, instead of waiting for an apology from her, I forgave myself for even wanting that apology. I forgave myself for being so bothered by it. And I focused on healing myself. And it took me 5 years, but I can say that I'm on the other side and I feel so good about it. And I, I don't, it's like I've reached this point where I'm so happy that I don't care what other people think. I don't care if they think he's crazy. I don't care if they think he's a sociopath. I don't care if they think that I'm a trophy or that I just collect broken men or whatever. I like don't care because I'm happy. And I hope that one day everyone can reach this level of happiness and, and like, genuine security in their relationship, but, and, you know, as for everyone else, like, fuck them, I know they're, they're not going to understand, and if they do understand, that's great, they probably are someone that I want in my life, if not, meh, whatever, I, I'm happy enough without them. I mean, all of you guys are so great and understanding, and I love you guys for that, so let's see, there's a little bit more to this one. Um, oh, okay, so their son has ADHD, SPD, so it's ADHD, um, sensory processing disorder, operational defiance disorder, and bipolar, and then their husband is PTSD, autism, and also a recovering addict with narcissistic personality disorder, possibly. Yeah, so that's like us, we're a damn alphabet soup family too, and I know how intelligent my son is, and I... I don't know, it's possible that his sensory processing issues do come from the neonatal opioid exposure because I did take Suboxone while he was, a, while he was, you know, while I was pregnant. And I did it, the doctors did know about it, it was under doctor's care, I did not do it properly, I did not get my own prescription, and I do not do what I did, get your own prescription, because you can have it, you can have a healthy pregnancy while on mat, you totally can, I just was stupid and thought that the rules didn't apply to me. but. Yeah, it is possible that my neonatal opioid exposure did affect Emerson's sensory issues. It's possible that he might, you know, autism could be from that. He doesn't have an autism diagnosis as of right now, or ADHD. He's a little too young for that, but I, I know he's intelligent, and I know I love him with all of my heart, and I do my very best, and I think that especially for some women, you know, maybe it is a direct correlation. Maybe you know that your actions then influenced what you, what is happening now in some way. You know, m maybe your child's having behavioral issues or learning issues. You need to just give yourself enough grace to forgive yourself because as long as you are trying and giving your child all that you can give them, as long as they have a loving, supportive home, you know, a safe home with food and family and you're giving them attention and you're not being neglectful or selfish or still putting your needs first, that is all you can do. You can't take back what's already happened. You can't change anything. And I don't want you to be miserable for the rest of your life because of something something that you could have done differently, something that you should have done differently. Don't worry about the should haves and could haves because that can't do anything for you now. Just worry about the present and the future. Work on being the best, best version of yourself so that you can be the best parent you can be for that child. That is all you can do. And yes, it's okay to feel guilty because in this hypothetical situation that I just talked about, like only this hypothetical situation, your actions caused something that affected your child's well-being. And guilt is normal. Guilt is something that happens when we make a mistake and we know we did something wrong and we don't want to do it again and we want to learn from it. But it becomes toxic shame when you are just beating yourself up over something you can't change. When you are letting it get in your own life now, when you're letting it hinder you and prevent you from being the best parent that you can be, that's when it's becoming toxic shame. That's what you don't need in your life. So, 
I'm sure someone will say something along the lines because, or along the way because of me being an addict at one point. I'm sure that'll affect Emerson in one way or another. Like, maybe his friends won't want to have, you know, Greg and I around. Maybe they won't want their child to be friends with Emerson. And I hope that we don't have to face that situation. Because I'm so vocal about my past, because I fight so hard against the stigma, especially in my hometown, I hope that people understand, but I know that it's always a possibility. Like I said, I just try to do the best thing. I try to do the next right thing. I try to do the next right thing for my recovery, the next right thing for my family, the next right thing for myself, and that's all I can do. Everything else is pretty much out of my hands. So, I know this is a long ass video. I hope that you guys stuck around, but I understand if you didn't. I I enjoyed doing this. This is really just me just kind of shooting from the hip and having fun. So thank you for sticking around this long. If you did, go ahead and leave a comment and say, I freaking made it. You talk way too much or something. <laughs> but yeah, that's all I have for tonight, guys. I will see you in the next video. Bye.